I am here representing Team 4 of the Innovation Center for Professional Learning and Leadership. And what we, one of our major deliverables this year is looking at our observational tools and platforms and looking at maybe revising them some. Our team has worked very hard. Thank you to all our team members who are out there. We had a separate meeting with Performance Matters because Performance Matters, which is the current tool we're using for our observation platform, has a new and improved model. And we met prior to this to kind of see what it looked like to see if this might be an option for us as a quick way to kind of move into the future a little bit with the tools that we're using. A group of principals had met over the summer, actually before I came on board as project manager, and had expressed some different concerns with the observation tool we're using. Everything from our 78 indicators that sometimes are a tad bit redundant to the fact that our platform itself, no offense to performance matters, is not always the most user friendly and we've had some glitches along the way. I have to tell you personally, when I went in and saw what they presented, I was quite amazed. I did not realize how archaic our tool was that we were currently using till I saw the other options that were out there. So the purpose of today is to have them come in and show you what the new platform looks like. There are a lot of places we can go after this if we are interested. There's a lot we can do with content, everything from basically taking exactly what we have and putting it on the new platform to looking at revising some of those indicators, looking at our rating scales. So the sky is kind of the limit with what we can do content-wise, but today we really wanted to show you what they had to offer platform-wise. So without any further ado, hopefully these ladies are familiar with you because you've seen, they've been with us for many years with Marnie Stockman and Beth Kowiecki. Morning all. Thanks for having us. Uh, as I told Greg, so you have some Queen Anne County folks at MAG, which is where we were out where, at least I was, hours ago. And so if you want to bust their chops, I said when I left there at 7 a.m., I was going to tell you that they were just coming in from the night at Bull on the Beach at 7 a.m. That's not exactly the case, but we might as well let them have that story. So um, if you see them, be sure, to, uh, be sure to let them know. I threw them under the bus. So thanks for having us. As, um, as Jackie said, um, I don't know if you know, Performance Matters merged with True North Logic a year and a half ago. True North Logic had an observation tool is one of the reasons why our owners looked at merging with that company um, because we knew we needed, uh, we wanted a refresh of the observation tool um, and didn't have the resources to build it. So we merged with an established company um, called True North Logic about a year, a year and a half ago. About a year ago they decided we would keep the name Performance Matters. So now if you go and Google True North Logic, you'll just see them under the Performance Matters name. Um, and we <coughs> adopted their observation tool, which was being developed, and have added to it. Um, as Shaki said, there are tons of things that you can do in the platform. All of the content is completely flexible by you. So any language, monikers, names on the page, all of that would be whatever you want it to be. So we're going to show you an example of a Danielson model observation. That is not Queen Anne's model, but you could put yours in there exactly have you, as you have it, or as Jackie said, if you decide to edit along the way, you can do that as well. The nice thing is, is that it is self-serviceable in some of the editing pieces, so you could even get, and I'm sure Beth will mention it, you could even get to the point where maybe individual schools wanted unique walkthrough tools. That's also very doable. So there's a ton of flexibility in the product. What we thought we'd do to keep it simple was to show you some high level bullet points of where we know we have struggled um, for you and with you and show you, okay, these are improvements in the platform. Uh, so you can say like, okay, these are big wins for us and then that's gonna take you into the platform to see what the look and feel feels like. And as Jackie implied, it doesn't feel like Windows 95, right? It's a, it's a much more fresher, more modern um, module. And then we're happy to answer any questions you have about it. Um, so. I'll let Beth go ahead and get started. Hey guys. Uh, so we're going to go over this. I'm going to present this to you in the beginning, and then we're going to revisit this after I've shown you the platform, right? But just know right off the bat, um, this platform is online all the time. There is absolutely no syncing. It auto saves every five seconds. So you can be in the middle of an observation, um, get called away, because that happens every now and again. I uh, get called away and you're done. Like it's just, it's safe. They'll just be listed as in progress. Okay, so it's um, online all the time. Again, no syncing, no worry about that. Uh, we do have pre-fill options available. It's a little bit different, but the pre-fill option is available. We actually have two different methods for pre-fill. 
right? You'd actually be able to see which one works for you better and then use that method for pre-fill. Um, we have a real-time notes option, okay? So you can actually sit into the classroom, you can script out the lesson, and I'll show you this. Then as you script, when you go to fill in the observation, uh, you can just drag and drop those notes, and those are actually timestamped, okay? Um, and then we can, uh, we can add observations. We, I'm sorry, we can add an observer to an observation. All right, so if you're the one doing the observation, you wanna add somebody else to that so that they can work on one, maybe it's for the end of the year, you can actually collaborate together. Um, we can talk about that a little bit more in detail when you have questions, or you can add a viewer. So if you're the principal of school, you can add the content first or by We also have the um, printing options that are available. Uh, you can have a longer version of the print option, or you can have a condensed version, and there's also the option of electronic signatures within the platform. There uh, is ease of reporting. There are quick insights that you can click on to get view of your data. So you can click on insights and you get a quick screen of what domains and what elements are strong or need more attention. And then there's also a reporting page that everybody has access to that you can go and you can generate a report that you want to have and it generates that report for you in an Excel sheet. Uh, there's a shared reporting that we have between both platforms, between the assessment platform and the observation platform. So when you have the unified platform and the observation platform, we actually have a shared report. I can do a, um, a, a report between that. And then the, uh, the platform is also, it's free when you transition to the observation platform. Uh, it's a free transition. So that transition is free as long as you have the assessment platform, the observation platform is free. Okay. So let's go into the platform. So let me just escape out of this. And we'll go in. So I'm in as a principal. Is there anything we can do with the lights to make that easier? Yeah. Because I know that's not this, super this clear. I'll try and go Control Plus. And I'll come stand up by it in case I need to point where her cursor is. Is that all right? Yeah. You my banner? I'm the live cursor. So. All right. Is that a little bit better? All right, so I'm going to come in. I'll go into an observation. I'm at, and as a principal. I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> this a little bit better. Uh, so I go into an observation dashboard. And so I come in underneath observation. These other pieces are just other products that we have. So we click into observation dashboard. All right, so you'll notice that across the top, really large, but that's okay. Across the top, I have one that's scheduled. I have a couple that are in progress. Again, there's no syncing. It just leaves it as in progress. And then I have zero that are finalized, so I haven't finalized any. If I wanted to schedule, I can just simply click on start one or I can schedule. I have a couple that are already you know, in progress. Blue would show that it's in progress. Um, in this case, because I'm in a demo site, I actually had already put your template in here and playing around working uh, with your teams. Um, we're not gonna do on that one. We're actually just gonna go into a demo template uh, if I wanted to start one brand new, I would have all my teachers within my building listed. Uh, we actually have a way that you can target whichever form you have is targeted to the correct teacher. So if a district has 13 different forms in the platform, you literally can target that out. So next to the teacher's name would be the exact form that they need to have. So there's no confusion as to what needs to happen, right? So that's pretty easy to do. So I'm going to come in here. I'm just going to start one. So if I come in, uh, this would take me to my page, and I'm just going to just quickly show you how there would be three domains in this case, in this form. Again, everything is customizable. I'm just going to show you how the platform overall looks. All right, so I'd have my three, essentially these are called domains, planning and preparation, instructional strategies, and then managing the classroom environment. If I wanted to pop any one of these open, I can click a plus sign and, and pop these open. All right, and then I'm going through, and I can then at this point read each one of the elements and then go through. I'm going to go control minus yeah, control on this. Minus that a bit. Yeah. So I'm going to go control minus, and I would show through. So in this case, I have each of the pieces of, of this, and then again, you would define this. So I could have, you know, satisfactory and unsatisfactory needs improvement and have nothing written inside of there, or I can actually define out my rubric and say, what am I actually looking for? You know, what is it as a district we said we are looking for for this element? We all have that defined rubric in place. We actually can have that written within the platform so that we know what we have. 
All right, so that piece is here. And then we can go ahead and we can just simply, you know, mark it as, you know, perhaps they come down as effective. Now, I'm just going to open this up, but I'm going to come down to the third one and I want to pop this open. Because So notice that that one just had, it had everything listed. I want to open this second or the third one down here because I want to show you the difference in this rubric. Because there's a couple of different options when you go to design this. Because you can also open it up to have like each one of those pieces to be a clickable box, right? So someone can be effective, but they might have some elements where they're highly effective, but yet overall they're effective for this. And then it sparks a conversation, right? Then you're actually working with the teachers when you're going over that piece. And you're like, you know what, overall you're effective, but there are certain things that you're doing that's highly effective. Or maybe it goes the other way, right? You're effective. And in order for you to be highly effective, I need you to work on this side. This would move you over here. So you can actually use these as clickable boxes. So you rank the overall element as one thing, but you have clickable boxes that you can mark so that you have that conversation. Again, it's whatever you all decide. It's just that flexible as a platform that you all can make some decisions. All right, so that shows you the element pieces. Again, what you decide to put into the domain and what you decide to put as the element, and what you decide to use in these boxes, and even what rubric and what scores that you decide. If you don't want to use the ineffective, developing, effective, that's all customizable. Okay? Now, if I go back up to the top, this would be your rating. Um, just call a little bit more attention. In each section, you can choose to put an evidence box. All right, and I'm going to call back to that in just a second. You can upload attachments in each spot. So you can pull an attachment. If they have a piece of the lesson plan that goes along with that, you actually can upload that if they send it to you electronically. All right, or take a picture and upload that as well. Okay? Amber, do you have a question? Okay. I was gonna ask that question because I know in other county we could upload an artifact that yep. was highly effective and we're really trying to show the evidence. That Absolutely. Yes. You can choose where to put those attachments. Yep. So as she said, each you can one. put it under each bucket, right? Or overall, you can make that decision. So you have multiple places where I know before, sometimes you can only put one in. You can have multiple. Yep. Okay. So this is just a little bit going through on the rating side of it. Now, I'm going to jump all the way to the end on the right-hand side and then work my way back over. All right. So we have this one box called a discussion. Most of my districts opt to turn it off. Um, but it really is just like a dialogue box back and forth between the observer and the observee, uh, almost like a discussion board. None of my districts have turned it on. I have six different districts. None of them have opted to turn it on. It has a general pre-conference and a post-conference thread to it, um, but I haven't had anybody take advantage of it yet. Uh, but it's easily turned off, and then you don't even see the, the box. The next section is details, and there's a lot you can take advantage of in the details. So it's going to track this initial information from the top observee down to the acknowledged on for everyone. I These doubt they can read that from back there. You might want to. I'm sorry. You can't read that. <laughs> um, okay, so it's going to track the observee, the observer, or observers. This is where you can add an observer. All right, definitely the person that's doing this is tracked, but you can add an additional observer. You can also add somebody to be a viewer. All right, so if I'm the principal and I'm observing a science teacher, I can go through and I can add Michael so that he's able to keep track of that as well. And then that would land on his dashboard so that he can go in there and he can see that one as well. Very helpful, right? Have not, and you couldn't do that in our platform. Um, it's also going to track who started it. It's going to track the date of when it was started. It's going to track any time that was modified, the date that it was last modified. It's also going to track the date that it was recorded on, and you can modify this date. All right, so if you happen to not have your computer with you, but yet you do a walkthrough or you do an observation, and you do it old school and you just write it out, but you've done it on a such and such a date, you actually can go in, and even though you're starting it on the 11th, you can go back in and say, well, I did the observation on the 9th, and you can track that date. And you can adjust that date. And then whenever the um, observation is finalized, it will record that date. That is done by the principal or the, whoever's doing the observing. And then whenever the teacher goes in and acknowledges that, and we'll talk about that. You then can add additional fields. This is whatever you deem as important. 
You can track the school, although that's not naturally tracked anyway in the sense of um, you know, where they're from, the location that they're from. Uh, but you can actually report out on this. You can track the school. You can track the grade in the course. Uh, you can track the, uh, whether they're tenure or non-tenure, whether it was announced, unannounced. Uh, in this case, it's a drop down, so it doesn't even need to be typed in. Uh, you can actually do radio buttons, whatever. We have some districts that I'll type that I'll actually have um, uh, questions like further steps, next steps. You can put that in and make it a text field. So there's all kinds of different options in this case to be able to record in, in your details. All right. The next section is our evidence session. All right. So this is where you can go in and you can script. So I can walk in. I can start my evidence session. And I can simply go in and just start typing. And this is exactly what I would type, of course. And then hit. And then just keep going in and then hit, keep going in, and hit. So notice that it's tracking a time, and each time I track, it's gonna record that time, okay? Now, when I go to hit print, it's gonna have that time there. It's also tracking from the minute I start my, my session to the time period that I end my session. So legitimately, if I go into the beginning of the class and I start my evidence session, to the end of the class period, it's going to track that I was in there for however long I was in that class period. And that will now be safe. All right? So if I keep all those pieces and I keep, you know, logging in, logging in, logging in as to what I'm typing, I'm now tracking my session. All right? When I'm done tracking my session, I just click done, and that information is saved. I do have one district that starts one note session for a pre-conference. So they meet with them prior to, if it's an announced one, they track all the information for a pre-conference, then they start, start a second one for a post-conference, or I mean for the actual time period during the class, and then they start a third one for a post-conference. They just track their notes for that. So then when you get to the ratings, I can now use this little tool that's off to the side. I click on this little tool, it opens it up, and if I have information, I can now just drag that over. Notice that it doesn't go away. So if that was a really valid statement, I can drag that over multiple times in multiple places. But I'm also able to come in here, if this was a valid statement but only the first half, I'm actually able to come in here, you know, and then do some editing. Okay, so I can come in and, and remove a, a chunk of this delete, and then continue to add on, all right? I can also hit enter, and I can continue to write whatever else I want to write in that section, all right? So it's free for me to drag over and then to additionally type anything else that I have as evidence for this section, and then, of course, I can also upload. If I go back into my notes or my evidence session, it used to be called notes session. I have a hard time figuring that out. Um, please know that I can always import a document as well. So if I have their lesson plan, I can always import something in this section as well. All right, at the end of my session, I have the option to share whatever I choose to share. And it's broken out. So I can share the details section, the details section, right? The details or like who observed you, who can view, when was it finalized, when was it acknowledged. I can choose anything to share any of the details. I can choose to share the evidence. That's what I typed and what I brought over into the box underneath the evaluation piece is the ratings. I can choose to share the ratings. And then I can choose to share the evidence session. That's what I scripted. Or I can choose not to share what I scripted, right? Either way, you choose whether or not you share each of those pieces, okay? So you can choose. It is independent, so you choose whether or not you share. It is independent of finalizing. When you finalize, a score will be given, however you choose a score. A score will be given, an email can be sent, the teacher will get an email, and the email will say, click here for your finalized observation. They can click that link, it opens it up, 
and it'll say, you know, they chose not to share or they chose to share. And whatever you have shared with them, they can open that up to go in and see or not see what's been given to them. So that's the platform. It is incredibly flexible. I have one district that allowed their schools, they have 72 schools, each school made a school through the walkthrough. Plus they have the observations and the evaluations within the platform. Other schools are just doing their observations within. Observations and evaluations. But it truly is as flexible as you need it to be. So before we get to the evaluation piece where we would pre-fill parts, are there any questions about what the tools do or do not do from what you've seen there? Would that work on an iPad or something if you're using your walkthrough tool? It does. Okay. So just, again, it's all online all the time, so you don't have the offline piece. So, but, but everybody's infrastructure is much better for that today. Are the three components weighted differently, or is that yeah. district decision? District decision. Okay. So you design the weighting of this, okay. right? So if you you can decide not to score it, okay. it would still go through. It just wouldn't generate a score at the top, even when you finalize it. It would just would not generate a score. Okay. Um, it would still give you insights as you would see it overall how it was rated. It just wouldn't give you a score at the top, right? Which is what most walkthroughs would do. Um, but the observations, if you can decide, you can do summative weighted, you can do weighted, you can do average, so it really does. And we would work with our team to help make the scoring work for you. Uh, the other piece of this is just to show you what the pre-fill option looks like. Uh, so this is being released in um, December 22nd. Uh, so this is um, a mock-up because it's not been released yet, but it is going to be released. So if I have my form and then I want to be able to use the pre-fill option, this is one of our options. We're going to have two. I click on the pre-fill option. All of my observations that I've done previously will pop up. So you might right. not be able to read this, but this says the formal observation on this date, these informal walkthroughs on these dates. So these are all individual observations that have been done for a teacher over the year. Okay, and I can pick one or I can pick all of these. I can pick the one that I like, like, hey, this is the one I really want to start with, right? And I can come over and I can say, I really want to start with this, um, this formal observation that I did on this date. So I click into this one and then I click pre-fill. So when I click the pre-fill, everything will come down and it will show me what I had typed into each of these. It will show me what was done overall and it will give me that score. All right, every one that I do after that will add the comments in. It won't do an average of the score or any of that nature, okay? So, but it will add each of the comments that were made on each of those dates. But you would probably want to go back in and double check where the scores are laying out to make sure that that, that is where you want to end up on that score piece, okay? Um, but with that being said, it does build out your piece. It also shows you overall what your trend line is for each of the six that you had done over time, right? So you can say, where are we wanting to end up? And then you can choose to say all six of them, or you can choose to say, like, I only want to see these three, so you see the trend line for the three. So you get your snapshot of where you were, so that you have that help going into it. But you get the comments pulled over in that sense. So it doesn't do the average of the score, and it would only bring over the score of the first one that you pull. But it does bring the comments for each of the ones that you decide to click on to bring over. So it does pre-fill. And the, and the other point that I want to bring up is that it doesn't take an overnight fill. Because right now when you select the pre-fill, that requires an overnight fill. This just happened, right? This came over and it brought it over immediately. So there's the advantages of this. Yes, sir? And, and on that feature list where they list the mm -hmm. formal and formal, that's every observation they've heard regardless of who performed it. Because if I'm observing, it's going to have my standard. If the supervisor observes, I don't necessarily see that supervisor. It would only be the ones that you've done or that you have access to. 
they're a really good question and I can get some clarification around it but if you're added as an observer <coughs> or you're added as a viewer would it bring those over that's a great question I can bring that back for you yeah. it sounds like what we would have to make sure the principal that anytime the supervisor went in and did an observation they made us a viewer and then if we were a viewer it should come through and that should we run some of those issues yeah, right. that we have currently where we can't see it but and vice versa again you have versa. the option of deciding what you want to see you, know, you can click on it or not click on it but we would want to see you know do you have the option if you're added as a viewer will that pull that over so you have the option of clicking on it well that makes up a little bit more mm -hmm. definitely Let's see if I can get more on that. Not to put you guys on the spot, but our supervisors were curious if you had an informal walkthrough document in your demo mode that you could show. I think there was. Sure. Like a, like a walkthrough, just a. Yes. Wait, right now, so there's, we're there's also a form in there. I didn't build it, so we don't know what it is. I hope they're not <laughs> checking for so skirt one of our teams is we'll working out. on making some <coughs> walkthrough forms that are consistent across the county, and that might be another thing we want to see added into this as well. So, so we can see what this one is. I would also be happy to go in our live site and get samples from districts of what they've been doing um, from Florida to New Jersey and everywhere in between. So happy to send some to you, but we can certainly pull up and see. It is in our demo site that folks know we show, so it should be good. And can, can, we build, can we build one? Yes. yes. Okay. Anything they're looking for? The yeah. answer to that is we can build. Oh, okay. you, you build, we build, right? <laughs> and I'll show you how to build. Yeah. Even if better. They're, if, they're, if they're simple walkthrough forms without complicated scoring. So the more complicated scoring, the more you probably want our technical staff to help you make sure the scoring is correct. If these are basic walkthrough forms, we can teach you how to build them yourself and you could create them on the fly. It's a much more self-serviceable platform that creates it immediately instead of having to build. Um, so I think that's definitely a strength. So one of the things I like to say is that I'm not necessarily tech savvy and I build these. And I actually don't necessarily enjoy it and enjoy it. Like, hey, I, I got some free time, it's what I want to do. But I do enjoy figuring out like the, the pieces of this. And they are pretty, um, they're pretty uh, self-explanatory when you go to build. I may need to log out as her. And see who's got a form. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to put you on. No, 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 no. <laughs> I did too, I, like, I knew exactly where I was clicking. Hey Beth, yes. If you if you have um, samples that you'd like to send, you, you, I'm part of the innovation team that's working on that. So if you want to just sure. send a couple of those examples rather than us going through and trying to find one, uh, we could just take a look at it. At sure. One of our team meetings. And I just pinged Utah to see if they can get us an answer real quick about the pre-fill somebody else's observation into yours. I suspect the answer is yes, but we'd like to confirm when it's not in production and haven't actually submitted it. So other questions while she hunts through there? And then did you want to show some reporting pieces as well? Yeah. I mean, I can show it on a live site. So I can go into as a demo principal and so show maybe. Why don't maybe. you do reporting and then we'll yeah. go on. Yeah. <laughs> that's rolling around in your minds right now that you want to ask them about the platform itself while they're looking for this? Were any of you really hoping that you needed to wait for an overnight build? <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to have to think it again? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I will share coming from Dorchester and having used this and I shared with my supervisor colleagues earlier in the oh, year yeah. the, the ease of this versus what we're doing now and just just a couple of pieces that you mentioned that the notes section is so super helpful when we're at time stamps your notes and then when you go in and can just easily drag those notes over it's so so helpful and then the, the digital signature piece is, is extremely right. helpful as well as in, you know and prior to that scheduling with the teacher um setting up the date and then you know kind of eliminating the, the paper massive paper trail is just uh is very helpful. So I, I, I really like when we switched over from the, the old system to the logic 
uh, really what kind of work. So. And actually, we're working really hard to get them. So you know how you had all those forms that came down? Yes. So we're working really hard to get them targeted. Sure yeah, <laughs> so one for each. Uh, so the reporting piece of this can be turned on. Uh, so if we were to come into the uh, Danielson template um, and this come into this, this piece, so this is what you'd have an option to generate a report really quickly in this sense. First of all, you have a date range, right? So whether you're doing a walkthrough tool or whether you're doing a, um, the observations that have been done in your building, like you're trying to check, like, where are we? What's your the date range? that need to get done. Uh, you can determine your date range, and then you can quickly go through and say, okay, how many do we have within this date range? And you'll be able to determine how many have been acknowledged. You can click on the um, acknowledge date, the cut score, or a raw score, whichever one you want to use. And we would determine that whenever we come through. Like, we would give you a date and say, hey, these are the ones you really want to click on. Um, whether or not it's been shared and what has been shared. Uh, and if you all are being consistent across the district, are we all being consistent on what we decide we want to share? Um, the status, whether it's completed or in progress, like where are we on these? Whether they've been finalized, any of the evidence, you actually can track all the evidence and all the statements that have been made. Um, and then the, the rateable competencies, that's going to essentially be where they fell. Are they affected? Whatever your rubric has, we actually can track that. And then once we have this in an Excel doc, you can do all the pivot tables that come with it and get additional information that, that will come through. You have that report and it generates that quickly so you're able to track easily where you are either within your building or within the district or within your cohort of teachers that you need to track by content area. So you can easily track where you are on your observations or walkthroughs whatever. As a principal, if you're sitting down here and you do have a walkthrough tool, how many walkthroughs have we done? Where are we? What does the data look like? And then go from there. Uh, and then we also have a dashboard that will give you some insights. I do think I have something on a Texas site. Um, you know what? If you go to demo and assume Holly Wright in Ob's dashboard, it's modified data. Um, while she pulls up the, the walkthrough piece, if you're thinking, yeah, I like this, would like to see what this looks like, um, this is already a live platform, so we could turn Is it demo.install? Sorry. You what? Demo.install? Uh, no, demo.truly. Oh. Um, so if you wanted to pilot some or try it with a group of teachers, <coughs> I, I know you'll have to work with your, with your union on what you would do there. Or if some of you just wanted to play with it this year, that would be a possibility, since there's no purchase involved if some of you wanted to try it and then have it for next year. All of that's possible. So in the, in the same flexibility of the platform, you have flexibility in the implementation. So it's one of those, if you can imagine it, we can probably support it. But that's all your decision, not our decision. You see one with all the walkthrough tools. I'm thinking about that's a lot of information. And the amount of walkthroughs you're going through, would it become good? I mean, I'm just trying to see that. Nope. We got signs walking to We have our math sure. tool. We have our co-teaching you know, uh, walking to I'm just trying to keep all that straight. So I think one thing that's different about this piece of the platform is the targeting notion so that it, um, it kind of eliminates some of the noise for other people. So if you are the science supervisor, you don't have to be looking at the math tool, the ALA tool, and pick like which tool of these, or which one of these is mine. Um, and same thing for the teacher. If we've targeted the teacher to get science walkthroughs and overall observations, that's all that's sort of an option for them. So you can address it so that it does, and it doesn't bog down the system because it recognizes, you know, which tool do we have that makes sense. You don't have drop downs like, all right, it's all 72 tools and I'm Walkersville, so I'm way at the bottom alphabetically. <laughs> Ooh, we can even show insights. Yes. I assume you'll be able to show them here, too. So. Yeah. So I'm just going to go into one that's already started. Yep. So this is a um, modified Danielson, which they use as a walkthrough. Although it doesn't look all that modified from here. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we open it up. All that modified. That looks, that looks like I'm a full Danielson. I'm thinking it's pretty much a Danielson. So... When you build out the Danielson framework, if that's what you're choosing to use, where you have all of the components and elements, if your walkthrough only wanted to focus on one piece of it, you could just build the form to have. So that's what we've seen is a lot of them just pick 
the components that they want, or they build one for science that's just around the back to the science. Um, I can't remember the name of them. So not the content standards, but the the yes, the the um, you know the activities. Like Here we lab go. Lab work. Wait a second. Wait a second. Okay. Um, so you can just build it around those particular components, like in math, you can do the standards of mathematical practices on with like my native tongue instead, instead of pretending to be in the science one anyway. Right, you could do it just around those pieces if that's what you're interested in doing your walk. And I think on. if we can get some samples to that team, that'll be that's really all that we need to worry about. Because we want to have some time to get some feedback from everybody and kind of see where we're gonna go with next step. Great. So while there Closing things up, if you don't mind, link to your agenda is a Google Doc to get some feedback. I'm going to let you just work right with the tables that you're at and ask for you to list some strengths that you see about this new platform, some questions and concerns that you still have, and then what might be some next steps. Because let me throw out there, if we're looking in this direction, probably just seeing it has already got your mind going in a lot of different directions. I know the team has already talked about what do we do as far as looking at the indicators. Do we want to Obviously, if we're looking at the pre-fill, if our ratings on the observation tool match the ratings on the evaluation tool better, that would make for an easier pre-fill and an easier tracking of progress. Is that something we want to look at? We're obviously at some point going to have to bring in our teacher association and, and make them involved in this process. But we also would like to view this more as not reinventing the wheel, not reinventing our whole observation evaluation process. We're just ramping up the tool and making it better. And really, even with the ratings, we're hoping to look towards more transparency. Teachers might have a better idea of where they stand if they know from their observation document what their rating was going into that evaluation rather than just our current satisfactory unsatisfactory. <coughs> so think about those things. Think about next steps in that terms and give us some feedback because this afternoon in our Innovation Center team, we're going to start to review that and see where we're going to go from here. And can everybody please thank Marty and Beth for me? Thank you. Thank, thank you. all of you. If you have questions, feel free to send them to Jackie and we will happily send you some. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, so you so can take a few minutes just to do that, and then we'll do a quick. Yeah. Vice Department of Education, and she's an expert on Title IX, um, and so uh, she has a basic presentation for you. Her materials and her references have already been distributed to you by Betsy through um, the agenda today. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Amy. Good All morning, right. Amy. Good morning. Good morning. Take it away, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Amy Niedzelkowski. I'm an attorney with the U.S. Department of Education in their Office for Civil Rights. Thanks for being with me here this morning. Um, I'm not able to hear all of you, but I know that you can hear me. So hopefully if there's questions that come up along the way, Mark can text them to me and I'll do my best to answer them. We're going to talk today about sexual harassment especially student-on-student -student sexual harassment and what a school's obligations are to address those kinds of incidents when they occur. But before we get started, I'm not sure how much familiarity you have with the Office for Civil Rights or OCR or if any of you have worked with us before. So we are an arm of the U.S. Department of Education and we're in charge of enforcing a couple of civil rights laws in schools. So those include Title VI, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, Section 504 and Title II of the ADA, which pertain to disability discrimination, and then the reason we're all here today, which is Title IX. And Title IX is a federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in schools. OCR has a couple of functions. We investigate complaints. We, we provide technical assistance to the public and to schools, like what I'm doing here today. We conduct compliance reviews from time to time of different schools to see how they're doing pertaining to these laws that we enforce. Like I said, today we're going to talk exclusively about Title IX. And when I say Title IX, people frequently think of sports. Right When Title IX was enacted back in 1972, it was most often used to apply to equity in sports so that boys and girls would have equivalent athletic opportunities 
in school. However, Title IX also applies to sexual harassment and sexual violence that takes place in schools. And sexual harassment, sexual violence is a form of sex discrimination. So that's how Title IX comes into play. So today we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. I'm going to go through them in a, as a list and then we'll break them all down separately. Um, usually when I do these kinds of technical assistance trainings, I have a PowerPoint that everybody can use as a guide. Unfortunately, we've had some policy changes lately and we do not have an approved PowerPoint yet that I was able to use. So you're going to have to kind of be old school about this and just take some notes. And like I said, to the extent that there's questions, please ask. If anything comes up or if anything was missed that I'm talking about, um, Mark or somebody can get back in touch with me and I'm happy to go over it again or provide answers to any questions. So um, from an organizational point of view, we're going to look at the following topics. We're going to talk about why it's important to address incidents of sexual harassment and sexual violence in schools. We'll talk about how prevalent it is in schools and the effects that it can have on students. We're going to talk about Title IX itself. What does Title IX really require? I know I said it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, including sexual harassment, but what does that really mean in everyday life when you're running a school? We'll talk about what kind of conduct constitutes sexual harassment and sexual violence. So what is it that you should be on the lookout for, that your staff should be on the lookout for, um, to know that might rise to the level of sexual harassment. We're going to talk about what a school needs to do once it knows or it should have known about sexual harassment. What is the school's required response and how do you We're going to touch on the technicalities of Title IX. What are the required policies and procedures? And as principals, your job is to implement those policies and procedures. Usually they're made at a district level, so we're not going to get too into the weeds about the technicalities of them, but I really want to focus on why it's important to know what they are, how to find them, and then to follow them. And lastly, we're going to talk about what are some steps we can take to try to prevent sexual harassment in school. And I say that with a really realistic point of view. So I work in schools all the time. I've been a teacher in my life. I understand you can do all the training in the world with students, but incidents are still going to occur. Um, OCR, when we get a case that involves sexual harassment in our office, really what we're looking at is not so much the underlying action as much as what did the school do to address it once it came to their attention. So all those topics that I just listed, we're going to go through them one by one, and I'll break them all down hopefully in a way that'll be concise, but that it will make sense. Also, before I get started, um, the idea that Title IX includes sexual harassment between or among students isn't something that's new. It goes back to the late 1990s when there were a string of U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, there are two particular doc documents from OCR that can be really helpful, and I provided links to those earlier this week. One is a sexual harassment guidance document from 2001. So I know it seems old, but it's still relevant. It's still in play, and that's what we use in our office to guide our cases. There also was a supplemental document that came out in September 2017, and that one is written in a Q&A format. It's much shorter than the 2001 document, so that would also be helpful for you to review. Um, those of you who are familiar with this particular area of school law probably heard about a document that came out in 2011 from the Office for Civil Rights that was called a Dear Colleague Letter that addressed sexual harassment and sexual violence. That document was rescinded by OCR earlier this year. It's no longer a valid document. So to the extent that you have copies of that, um, I would not rely upon it any longer. I will say that in reality, not a whole lot changed between that 2001 document and the um, 2011 Dear Colleague letter. So it's not like we've completely reinvented the wheel. There's just a couple of details that are no longer in play in these kinds of cases. So 2011 Dear Colleague letter is out. 
you should be guided by the 2001 guidance document and the 2017 Q&A document. So let's get started and get into the meat of what we're going to talk about. Um, I said the first thing we were going to talk about was why it's important to address sexual harassment and sexual violence. In short, why are we here today? What's the point of all of this? And we start by understanding that Title IX's purpose is to allow students to access a school's educational program in an environment that's safe and it's free from sex discrimination. And there's a presumption of sorts that if a student is being subjected to sexual harassment or sexual violence, it's going to impede his or her ability to benefit from their educational program. And one of the questions I get a lot when I do these kinds of presentations is, I get it, sexual harassment, sexual violence is important, but isn't that sort of an older person's problem? Something that's a bigger issue on a college campus than say an elementary, middle school, or high school? And the answer to that is yes or no. So yes, I see more cases that come up in the college setting, However, I see a lot of cases that come up in the um, elementary and secondary setting as well. I've seen sexual violence cases with students that are as young as fifth grade. Um, we see a lot that come up in the older high, as the students move into high school. But we're going to talk, remember I said, about what kind of conduct we're looking at. Sexual harassment can come into play with um, social media, texting, comments that students make to each other. So it's easy to see how these things can start cropping up at younger and younger grades. But why do we care about all this? What's the problem with sexual harassment? What can it do to a student and to a school? There's lots and lots of research about this. And what a lot of that research agrees with is that students who are victims of sexual harassment, that can jeopardize their academic achievement. It can undermine their physical and emotional well-being. Um, victims of sexual harassment, sexual assault are much more likely to suffer from conditions like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, it can lead to alcohol and substance abuse, and suicide. So we want to mitigate the damage that's caused as much as possible. So those are damages to the students, but there's also damage that can be done to the school or to an entire school system. So there's a risk of damage to a school's reputation if sexual harassment, sexual violence isn't handled appropriately. There's certainly a risk of money damages to a school if a parent files um, a private lawsuit in court. So when a parent comes to us in OCR and files a complaint, we're looking at remedies to fix the situation, bring a school back into compliance. Um, we look at things like perhaps counseling for a victim, um, you know, if there are any coursework that was missed, that kind of stuff. OCR doesn't get involved in money damages. However, if a parent chooses to be in a different forum and take their case into federal court, for example, a school can be on the hook for significant money damages. So it is important Obviously, we want to do everything we can to help the students, but to keep in the back of our minds, there's some real um, reputation and business risks that go along with not addressing these kinds of cases appropriately as well. Um, so Mark, I don't know if you want to ask the audience if there's any questions about that, and if so, you can send them to me, and I guess I'll hold all the questions till the end, if that works. Sounds great. Anybody have any questions they want to ask? And I'll forward to you. Okay. 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 So we're talking about this law, Title IX. What are the goals of Title IX? What does Title IX really do? Well, it prohibits sex-based discrimination in any educational or program or activity that receives money from the federal government. So what that means is almost every school district, that, or almost every school that's out there, with the exception of private schools that don't receive any federal funds. Um, when we talk about sexual harassment. I keep using the words kind of interchangeably, the phrase sexual harassment and sexual violence. Um, sexual violence is an extreme form of sexual harassment, so bear with me. I tend to flip back and forth between those rules, but all of the information I'm going to give you today would apply to instances of sexual harassment and sexual violence, like a sexual assault. I know a lot of you are thinking, but a sexual assault is a criminal matter, and you're right, it is but there's also Title IX implications as well that we're going to talk about. 
So what do I mean by Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in a recipient's education programs and activities? What does education programs and activities mean? Essentially, that means all of a school's operations. Um, it can also apply to third parties who come onto a school's campus or your students when they go somewhere off campus if it's part of an education program that's tied to your school. So think about things like certainly what happens in the halls of your school, the gym, the locker room, your students when they travel off campus, so to a band trip, a senior trip, um, players playing at an away game. It can even come up when something happens outside of school. You know, two students exchange sexually inappropriate text messages at 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. There's no dispute that that is outside of school and outside of your control. But what happens when those messages then spill into the school on Monday morning? That can also become part of your education program and activity. Obviously, you are not responsible for what two students do at home on a weekend, but your responsibility may be triggered when the consequences of those texts come into school and start to pose a problem within the walls of your school. So with some of that stuff in mind, we know the legal basis of what I'm talking about, Title IX, but what is sexual harassment? And so I want you to think just to yourselves, when I say sexual harassment, what kind of conduct are you thinking of what comes to mind? And we'll go through some examples in a minute, but before we do that, let's say that you have a teacher who comes to you and says, you know, I just saw this thing happen in the hall and I wanted to make you aware because it might be sexual harassment, I'm not sure. How are you gonna make the determination of whether that conduct rises to the level of sexual harassment or not. And there's actually sort of a three part test or three different prongs that you want to see if the conduct falls within those three prongs. I'm going to tell you what they are and then we're going to talk about each one separately. So the first thing you're going to look at is, is this conduct conduct of a sexual nature? Was there something sexual about it? Not just was it physically sexual, but did it involve sexual language, sexual gestures, um, a sexual message being conveyed. The second thing is, was that conduct unwelcome? So did one of the two people or one of the group of people that was involved in it, did they not like that type of conduct? Did they not welcome that type of conduct? The third thing you're gonna consider is, did the conduct deny or limit the victim's ability to benefit from our educational program? I'm using the word victim um, I know that it's a loaded word, but it sort of makes it the clearest way to differentiate between the student who's reporting the conduct or the conduct was um, against versus a student who's accused of engaging in sexual harassment. If you find that all three of those things are present, that you had conduct of a sexual nature, that it was unwelcome, and that it denied or limited the student's ability to participate, then you have what's called a sexually hostile environment and that's when you need to take further action. So what do I mean by conduct of a sexual nature? Let's break it down. Um, we're talking about things like unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, comments about an individual's body, sexual activity in which they've engaged, their sexual attractiveness. We're talking about sexually suggestive touching, gestures, sounds, comments, um, displays of sexually suggested objects. We're talking also about harassment of a person who doesn't conform to gender stereotypes. What do I mean about that? Think about um, a female student who has very short hair and may dress in more traditionally masculine clothes. Think about a boy who's involved in school activities that are more traditionally female. And then those students are getting picked on, bullied, harassed because of that. Um, I, I'm sure all of you have seen or at least heard of really bad situations that go down on social media. 
or they go down via text. Think about photos that may go around the school by social media or text. Think about rumors that are started on social media, that kind of stuff. And I earlier said, you know, there's only so much you can control about what a student is going to post on Instagram or what kind of snap is going to go around. I got that. What happens though from your responsibility point of view is when that out of school conduct comes into your school and now the student whose naked picture was getting circulated via text message is now being harassed in the hallways because of it. So that's what I'm talking about as far as conduct of a sexual nature. One more, I guess, point is that there's some, remember I had said sexual violence is also considered an extreme form of sexual harassment. So if you have an incident in your school of rape, sexual assault, um, something along those lines, as a school, you likely have reporting obligations to the police and you need to do that. You're legally required to do that. However, your legal obligations don't end once you've made a report to the police of that sexual assault or rape. There are still going to be Title IX responsibilities that you have as well. So all of these things that I'm talking about today are going to apply in incident, inc instances of sexual violence as well. Um, and it's kind of hard to wrap your head around sometimes. If the police are investigating it, then you know why do I have to do this too? Well, Title IX is different than a criminal process. Remember, Title IX is all about allowing a student to benefit from their educational program or activity. That's not what the criminal justice system is all about. The criminal justice system is about finding perpetrators and bringing them to justice through the criminal justice system. Um, it doesn't do things like you know, making sure a victim can still go to school, go to school and participate in their educational program. It may, the DA may decline to prosecute a case for one reason or another. So Title IX is looking at that type of sexually violent conduct from a different lens than the criminal justice system is going to do. Okay, so now we know what I'm talking about. Remember I said to be sexual harassment, you need to have conduct of a sexual nature, that conduct has to be unwelcome and it has to deny or limit a student's ability to benefit from their educational program. So we talked about what conduct of a sexual nature means. The second part of that test is the unwelcomeness factor. What do I mean by the conduct has to be unwelcome? Well, it means that the victim didn't like what was being done to them, said to them, said about them, it's unwelcome. Couple of things to keep in mind. Acceptance does not equal unwelcomeness. So you might have a victim that is that um, has had these things done to them and they may not right away go and report it. Don't assume because a student didn't report it that it was welcome conduct or that, that the student didn't fight back or wasn't upset about it that it was welcome conduct. That might not be the case. So. How do you determine welcomeness? So there's a couple of best practices that we follow when we look at the welcomeness prong of all of this. And one is get statements from witnesses, including the victim and the accused student, of what was going on before the incident, during the incident, and after the incident. You know, assess the credibility of the victim and the accused. Are their versions of what happened similar to other witnesses? Um, look at the prior bad acts of the accused. If you have an accused student, and this is the eighth time that you've heard rumors about this type of conduct being committed by him or her, that's something to consider when you're determining whether this conduct was welcome. Consider the victim's reaction. Again, don't assume that the lack of a reaction means that it didn't happen or that it was um, welcome type conduct. It's just one of a variety of factors to consider. And also importantly, ask for miscellaneous evidence like screenshots of text messages, 
Um, if anybody has done a screenshot of their Snapchat, any type of social media messaging that was going on or social media posts, all of that can be helpful in determining what was really going on here, especially if the accused student is saying that the victim was a willing participant and didn't mind or that you know it was just a joke and it wasn't that big of a deal. Looking at all that different type of evidence can help you make that kind of decision of whether it was welcome or not. Um, not all conduct of a sexual nature, though, is going to be unwelcome. So think about, um, and I'll use a little bit of explicit language just to get the point across. Let's say you have two female students and they're kind of, it seems like they're playing around and they're calling each other sexually derogatory names as they go down the hall. And they're doing it loudly. They're calling each other slut or whatever sexually derogatory term you want to put in there. They're laughing, they're playing around, everybody seems to be having a good time. You pull them both into your office, you talk to them, and they both say, we were just joking. You know, is that conduct of a sexual nature? Yeah, they're using sexual terms. Is it unwelcome? Probably not. It seems like they were both willingly participating in it. Was it appropriate? No. Was it something that may have violated another provision of your code of conduct, like inappropriate language or disorderly conduct? Yeah, of course. But your analysis of whether this is a Title IX problem can stop right here because you would say, you know what, this conduct was welcome. It was rude, it was crude, it was inappropriate. They can be disciplined under another provision of the code of conduct, but we don't have a Title IX problem here. And then your analysis can end at that point. Um, okay, and Mark, if there's any questions, just feel free to text them to me or you might be able to message them to me through, um, through WebEx. Okay, so if there's any questions, please ask. Okay, so now remember I said there's three things we need to look at to determine if we have a sexually hostile environment. Conduct of a sexual nature, if so, was that conduct welcome or not? And the third is, did the conduct deny or limit the student's ability to participate in or benefit from their educational program? And this is really saying, you know, what was the effect of this conduct on the victim? Remember I started by saying, you know, there's a presumption, so, and even more so I think at the younger grades, that this kind of conduct is going to limit a student's ability to fully participate in school. But consider that when you're making this determination, Consider the conduct from both the victim's point of view and a reasonable person point of view. You know, you might have a situation where a parent calls you, and I'm gonna use an extreme example. You know, you have two kindergartners on the playground at recess, and one runs up to another one, gives them a quick kiss on the cheek, and runs away. And the parent of the kid who received the kiss calls you and says, my daughter was sexually assaulted at school and is genuinely upset about what happened and genuinely believes that their child was assaulted. That's the subjective, that's the victim's point of view. But now sit back and look at it from a reasonable person point of view. Is that really what we mean by sexual harassment? Is that really conduct of a sexual nature that was unwelcome? If you're looking at it as a reasonable person, probably not. And um, it's probably not going to deny or limit a student's ability to benefit from their program. You know, this one time quick instance on the playground. Um, so, you know, you have to consider whether the conduct, you know, is it sufficiently severe? Is it something that's pervasive? Has it been going on for a long time? How often does it happen? Location can matter. You know, something with older students, it might be different if a comment is made in a big open hallway versus a dark corner of a locker room. Um, the relationship and the roles of the parties. You know, do you have a senior who's harassing a freshman who may feel very intimidated under the circumstances? So these are really case by case basis type decisions that you need to make. But more often than not, you're going to see that there is an effect on the victim's ability to participate in school. Certainly if you find you have a victim who is skipping school,
skipping class. You know, maybe the problem is always happening in gym class. This kid is cutting gym class a lot or just isn't coming to school altogether. That's an obvious sign. But then we need to look at some of the less obvious ones at, as well. Um, remember I said we're looking at the totality of the circumstances of what's going on here. And we're looking at it from the objective meaning the reasonable person perspective and the victim's perspective. But just to give you some different examples, let's say you have a boy who asks a girl out on a date one time. The girl doesn't like the boy. She comes complaining of sexual harassment. Probably not. You know, I don't even know that that's conduct of a sexual nature. Um, there doesn't seem to be particularly serious. It doesn't seem to be pervasive, any of that stuff. Um, what about now you take the same boy and he's been asking this girl out every single day and he tends to do it in a corner of the stairwell. Okay, well now you're getting, the facts are getting a little bit more gray and you need to kind of assess that. Taking it one step further, I know that we're talking about student on student sexual harassment, but certainly there are instances also that might involve a teacher. Um, if a teacher asks a female student out, or a male student, doesn't matter the gender, one time, you know, does that rise to the level of sexual harassment? Probably, yeah, definitely, yeah, because now you've got this teacher who's in a position of authority over a student. So it's the same action, one person asking another out on a date, but the asker, one is a student and one is a teacher. So just that one fact can really change how you need to look at what is going on. Okay, so again, I'll just remind you, any questions, feel free to send them my way. Now we know what sexual harassment is, right? We know it's conduct of a sexual nature, we know it's unwelcome, and we know that it denies or limits a student's ability to benefit from their educational program. So what does the school do next? When does your obligation kick in? We say a school has an obligation to respond once they knew or they should have known about possible sexual harassment. So once a student comes and reports conduct to you that sounds like it might be, even if it's not definitely for real certain sexual harassment, once you're on notice, then your responsibility to do something to address it kicks in. Um, even if you hear rumors about something that's going on, at that point you're on notice that there might be a problem and you really should take steps to address it. Um, a staff member reports it to you, you should take steps to address it. Um, if a staff member sees it, they need to know what their reporting obligations are as well. And that's why it's so important that your staff understands what kind of conduct might constitute sexual harassment and what to do if they see or if they think that they have seen that type of conduct or if a student reports it to them. Now you can have the best policies and procedures in the world in place, but if your staff doesn't know about them or know what to do if they see this conduct, then the procedures aren't very helpful. So your staff really should be aware that if they see possible sexual harassment going on, or if a student or a parent reports it to them, they should know what to do with that information. Typically it involves the teacher will then report it to a principal or a vice principal, and the principal or vice principal will take it from there, or whoever the sort of disciplinarian is in your schools, and every school is different. But really the important part for the teacher is knowing what to do with that information once they are aware of it. Um, so now let's assume you have noticed that there is a possible incident of sexual harassment. What do you do about it? So let's assume that you all are the person who's going to be in charge of investigating the complaint or getting to the bottom of what happened. Remember I said in the beginning, when OCR is looking at one of these cases, and to a certain extent even when courts are looking at them, Yes, we take a look at the underlying action. We look at what happened in the school hallway. What was the context or the content of the text message that went around? But what we're really investigating is how did the school response what, respond once they knew about it? Um, 
in many ways, your response is going to be similar to what it would be for any kind of discipline issue that you hear about. You know, schools are full of fights that are going around, bullying incidents, whatever it may be. Title IX just has a couple of extra requirements that go along with it. But it's not going to be completely, what you have to do is not completely dissimilar from what you would do in other types of investigations in your school. So the first thing you need to do, you want to take immediate and appropriate steps to investigate it and figure out what happened. You know, you get a report of what happened and there's the report that comes in and then there's the facts of what actually happened that you discover along the way as you're investigating it. So, you know, when a report comes in, you want to quickly start looking into it. Don't put it on the pile to address a couple weeks from now. Consider it serious and start your investigation. And you also need to take prompt and effective steps to stop the harassment. So if it's something that seems like a continuing situation, you're going to need to intervene right away to stop it sometimes even before your investigation is really off the ground or certainly before it is over. What's gonna be a reasonable response to an incident is really gonna be a case by case basis. Um, you know, the student that comes to you and says, Charlie's asked me out three times in the past three weeks. I don't like it, I feel harassed. Okay, you need to do something about that, but that's not going to require the urgency as the student who comes to you and says, you know, his ex-girlfriend is stalking him, sexually harassing him, and he's fearful about what's happening. So that one is probably going to take priority over the first example that I gave you. We understand that you may have competing interests, but no matter how minimal the incident seems, you need to at least think about, is this, does, is this something that rises to the level of sexual harassment? Okay, so the report has come in, a teacher comes to you and reports what they saw in the hallway. You now have the two students um, come down to the office. You probably have them separated. What's the first thing you need to think about? The first thing you need to think about is, is it okay for these two to go about their business in the school while I'm investigating? Or is there something I need to put in place to keep them apart and keep them safe during the investigation. We call those interim measures. Um, they come up in other contexts as well. You know, I've seen where we have cases of students who um, are fighting for one reason or another. You may want to keep those students separated. Well, the same thing happens in some cases of sexual harassment, certainly in cases of sexual violence. What do I mean by interim measures? Well, you might want to consider you want to change classes, change their bus assignment, um, have them meet with the guidance counselor right away. Um, do they need an escort in the halls while this is all being sorted out? Not every case will call for inner measures. Some will, but it's something to consider when a new case comes across your desk. That's your first step. As you get into the investigation, remember, you're gonna to have to look for, did the conduct really happen? And if so, we're looking for a school to take reasonable, timely, age appropriate and effective action to address it. So you need to end the harassment, eliminate any hostile environment that's been, been created. You wanna make sure that you try to the best you can to prevent retaliation against a victim or a person who reported. So, now we know what sexual harassment is, we know what a school's duties are, but how do you do all of that stuff? How do you make sure the investigation is done properly? How do you make sure you've done what you can to end the harassment or prevent retaliation? That's where your school's Title IX grievance procedures are going to come into play. Every school district should have Title IX grievance procedures. Like I said, that's usually something that comes from the top down. They tend to be the same set of Title IX grievance procedures that will apply to all of the schools in a district. Rarely do we see where an individual school will have their own individual procedures. Um, if you don't know what yours are, um, you should find out, and I'm sure you will have training on what they are at some point, or at least the distribution of them with some explanation. So Title IX has a couple of technical requirements in it. 
One of them is there has to be a notice of non-discrimination. So you'll see in a lot of publications where it says the Queen Anne's County Public Schools does not discriminate on the basis of race, sex, national origin. That's your notice of non-discrimination. And there's some technical requirements with that as far as Title IX is concerned. That's not really an issue that you as administrators need to be concerned with. Again, these are policies that are going to come, you know, usually from the board and then trickle down to the schools. All schools, another technical requirement of Title IX, and this one is more relevant to you, all school districts have to designate at least one employee to coordinate its efforts under Title IX. We usually call that person the Title IX coordinator. So um, I can't see you, so I won't ask you to raise your hand. It's more just of a, you know, think about it question. Does your district have a Title IX coordinator? If so, do you know who that Title IX coordinator is? And do you know what a Title IX coordinator even does? Um, the answer to all of those questions should be yes. We'll talk in a minute about what a Title IX coordinator's specific responsibilities are and how you may be interacting with them. But that's a te technical requirement of Title IX. And then the third one, and the one we're going to spend the most time on, is that all schools have to have these Title IX grievance procedures, meaning um, procedures that you're going to follow if a Title IX situation or a possible Title IX situation comes across your desk. Like I said, it's not gonna be completely different from what you have to do for other kinds of discipline incidents, but there are a couple of technical requirements of it. So think of your Title IX grievance procedures as sort of a rule book that you can follow when you have to investigate a Title IX complaint. Um, your Title IX coordinator, I'm not gonna get into the details of the notice of non-discrimination. Um, but you all have one, and as long as you have it, that's good. As far as the Title IX coordinator goes, um, your notice of non-discrimination, the grievance procedures, it should notify students, employees, parents, anybody who is reading um, the notice of non-discrimination or your grievance procedures, who the Title IX coordinator is. It should include their name, their title, how to contact them. and. Did you, can you still hear me? Just lost my screen. Give me one moment, I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize for that. Um, the Title IX coordinator actually has a lot of different jobs. Frequently a Title IX coordinator will have other roles within a school district as well. But when they're wearing their Title IX coordinator, that person should be trained in Title IX matters of what constitutes sexual harassment, the school's grievance procedures, you know, essentially they should be able to give the same training that I'm giving today um, with the addition of your own school district's grievance procedures. Title IX coordinators should be available to meet with students, parents, staff, administrators as needed. You know, when you're investigating one of these Title IX complaints in your building, you should be able to get in touch with the Title IX coordinator if you have questions or need some guidance about what to do. Um, there's flexibility in the role that a Title IX coordinator will play in an investigation. In some districts, the Title IX coordinator does all Title IX investigations. In other school districts, they're not really involved in the investigation. That's a local decision that will be made at your district level. Title IX coordinator also engages in record keeping. They should keep track of all of the Title IX um, complaints that come through the district. There's actually some reporting that needs to be done every year about that back to um, the federal government. And, you know, they should have an idea, you know, maybe you have one student who has been accused of sexual harassment multiple times. And let's say that student has moved on from the middle school to the high school. You know, the Title IX coordinator periodically should look through their records and say, are there any patterns that are going on here? You know, have we had um, 14 Title IX complaints this year that pertain to the marching band? Um, do we have this one student who's been wrapped up in a number of these complaints a bunch of times? Is there a location where these incidents seem to occur? You know, are they occurring in the parking lot of the football game a lot? Is that an area we need to pay more attention to? So your Title IX coordinator will look into stuff like that. And frequently, like I said, the Title IX coordinator is going to oversee Title IX training 
not just for administrators, but for staff and in some instances, students as well. Okay, so now we know what your Title IX coordinator does. Hopefully know who your Title IX coordinator is and how to get in touch with the Title IX coordinator. Um, but we also remember I said perhaps the most important part of all of this are the grievance procedures, knowing what your procedures are, how to find them, where to find them, how to implement them. And you know you should be able to go to your Title IX coordinator for help if you need it. Um, the grievance procedures, the most important thing about them is they are designed to provide a prompt and equitable response to Title IX complaints. So we're looking for things when you're doing your investigation, and this is where a Title IX investigation might differ, not necessarily, but might differ from some other ones that you do. What do I mean by prompt and equitable? Well, your Title IX grievance procedure should have some time frames in it for, you know, how long is it going to take to complete an investigation? How long will it take for the victim and the accused student to receive the results of the investigation or the outcome of the investigation? Is there a right to an appeal? You don't have to have an appeal process, but if you do, how long do I have to appeal? How long will it take for that appeal to be decided? There's some flexibility in the timelines. You know, some cases might be way more complex than others. So if your procedures say we have 10 days to complete the investigation, um, there might be some circumstances where you're going to have to run over the 10 days. That's fine, but your policy should still have time frames that are included in it. What do I mean by equitable? Well, it means what you do for one side, you should do for the other. So if you say to the victim, please give me all the evidence you have, the names of all the witnesses you think we should talk to, you should be asking the accused student for the exact same things. What you do for one side, you do for the other. If you are requiring or requesting parents be present for the victim, you should do that for the accused student as well. It should be a very equitable investigation for both sides. Um, You, the, the Title IX grievance procedures, they should provide for notice of the outcome of the complaint to the parties, meaning did you find that there was sexual harassment or not? As a best practice, it's a good idea to provide that notice in writing, but it's not required to do so. So let's say you're going to do it verbally and you call the accused student's parents and let them know the outcome. Make sure you call the victim's parents as well. With Title IX, there's also one other thing that is permitted. I'm sure that you're all familiar with um, with FERPA, and there's a lot of requirements as far as privacy goes and what you're able to disclose and not disclose. When you're providing notice of the outcome of a sexual harassment or sexual violence complaint. FERPA permits institutions to disclose to the harassed student any sanction that was opposed, imposed on the accused student that directly pertains to the victim. So what I mean by that is um, if a student has been expelled and is no longer going to be in school, if let's say the student and the victim were in class together, and you've now changed their classes. You've moved the accused student to a different algebra class. You're allowed to tell the victim about that. Um, what about something like you've assigned the accused student to community service, if you have sort of a restorative justice program? Is that something that directly relates to the victim? No, so the victim would have no entitlement to that information. Um, if part of the sanction is that the accused student is going to have to undergo weekly counseling with the guidance counselor, is that something that directly pertains to the, accused, the victim? No. So they would have no right to that information. Under FERPA, it's just the information that directly pertains to the victim. Primarily, if it's a way that's going to be keeping the accused student away from the victim, you're free to tell the victim about that. 
but nothing that's purely individual to the accused student. There's usually a fair number of questions about that. So um, if you do have questions, you can at the end we can address them or um, they can be sent to me and I'll get back to the district with some answers. So as you're doing your investigation, there's also, we said there's a couple of things that are slightly different from other types of disciplinary investigations in the school. One of them is with Title IX complaints, there's sort of a, some of them with the more severe ones, there could be an intersection between the criminal justice system and your school's Title IX procedures. And um, depending on what's happened, you may have an obligation to notify the police, especially because you're dealing with children. So um, you very well will have a state law requirement to notify the police if there's been a sexual assault in your school, but you also have to remember that you have this Title IX investigation that needs to be done as well. So sometimes what will happen is there will be two investigations of the conduct going on concurrently. You'll have the police looking at a sexual assault from a criminal perspective. You'll be looking at it from a Title IX perspective. Remember I said the criminal justice system, they're not looking at things like, um, is the victim able to benefit from his schooling because of all of this that happened? Um, should the victim and the accused student, should they continue to be in the same class or on the same bus? So that's where your Title IX hat is going to be a different kind of investigation than what the police are doing. This comes up a lot. I don't know if your schools have police in them, if you have a school resource officer, an SRO, but I have a lot of cases that come across my desk where, and it's not always a sexual assault. It seems to be um, most often with social media and sexting type incidents where the school resource officer will learn of, um, let's say nude photos that are being circulated around the school and the SRO, SRO who is doing his job, right? The police officer's job is to address conduct from a criminal perspective. He may take that information, file a police report, the district attorney gets it, and the district attorney does what he or she is going to do with it. And often in those kinds of situations, the Title IX angle of it, that ball gets completely dropped either because the school resource officer didn't know about Title IX or know that there was this Title IX obligation or um, what happened, what the SRO discovered wasn't adequately communicated to the administrators of a school. So the, the Title IX piece just kind of goes by the wayside. So that can be a problem and it's best practice to make sure if you do have a school resource officer in the building that he or she is aware of Title IX and that he or she knows that if there is an arguably sexual incident that happens, they should make the administrator aware so you can pick up the Title IX ball and run with it. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. So after the investigation happens, we talked about you need to provide notice of the outcome of the complaint. You also want to keep your eye on the situation and make sure that whatever measures you've put in place make sense and that they're working. So, you know, if you have a student who's been accused of sexual harassment four times this year and each time she receives one day of in-school suspension and the conduct keeps happening, um, it's very possible that that consequence isn't really effective in stopping the conduct that's a problem. And it's a good idea to do periodic check-ins to make sure that there are no further incidents between the victim and the accused student, that you've really kind of nipped it in the bud. I also started off by saying that we want to do our best to prevent these types of incidents from happening in the first place. So that's talking out of one side of my mouth. Talking out of the other side of my mouth and through my own personal experience with this is 
you could do the best training in the world for your students. And I know your district has done some. I know that there's been sort of a, you know, a poster or a sign campaign that's going on. And all of those things are great. And all of those things are actually very effective. However, you know, there may still be incidents that occur. So we recognize that that's going to happen, but we don't ever want to discourage the education piece from taking place. So I would say, you know, continue to do it, continue to be proactive with the hope of reducing the instances of sexual harassment, certainly sexual violence. Um, so how do you do that? How do you teach kids about sexual harassment? How do you teach them that it's wrong? How do you do this all in an age appropriate way you know certainly the message you're conveying to high school seniors is going to be different than what you're saying to fourth graders the vocabulary is different the kinds of lessons are different and you know, while a specific title IX training is great there's also only so many times you can pull your student body together and have an assembly or have a very specific training so as you think about this education piece think about are there opportunities in our existing curriculum where we can drop in the Title IX sexual harassment stuff. You know, usually it kind of neatly can be rolled into bullying prevention programs that you already have in place. You know, lots of students, I think, don't understand that when they send photos of, um, you know, partially or naked students around that that could be bullying, yes, but it also can be sexual harassment, that that kind of conduct and behavior has real consequences to it. Um, that comments that they make to each other, to other students, even if they don't intend for it to be harassing, it can still be harassing if the person who's on the receiving end of it finds that conduct to be unwelcome. So that education piece, I think one of the most important parts of it is really for students to realize what kind of conduct is not okay. And secondly, what to do if a person feels that they've been the victim of it. You know, to whom can they go to complain? That a student knows that there's something a school can do to address that kind of conduct. You know, do they tell a teacher? Do they report it to a principal? What will happen? Will there be an investigation? What, are there steps a school can take to stop it. Um, and that students know that there's consequences for that type of behavior. So I guess my final piece of saying is there's really some school culture that goes into this. Um, you know, if teachers are standing in the hallway when classes are changing and they see this type of conduct go on, but it's never reported, nothing is ever done about it, that sort of sends a message to the students that it's okay. You know, I recognize that in reality, a teacher cannot report every single instance of every single inappropriate comment that they hear or that they overhear. In reality, that's probably never going to happen. But when they start to see things that really rise to a level beyond just a stray comment, they see a student who's upset, you know, that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, your accused students are gonna get the sense that the school doesn't care and the perpetrators of this kind of conduct are going to say, hey, it's okay. I've been doing this for years. It's never been a big deal. I'm just going to keep on doing it. So that's where that education and prevention piece really comes into play because it sets the tone for the school that this type of behavior is not okay. It won't be accepted and that there's very real consequences for it if it occurs. So with all that being said, that's all of the information that I have to give to you. I truly, truly do invite questions from you, um, anything that I can clarify, I'm very happy to do that. So um, please get in touch with me and let me know. I think you can run the questions, I guess, through Mark and he'll get in touch with me. Amy, can you hear us? Okay, so thanks for letting me come in and talk to you today. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. Great, so if you have questions, just email them to me. I'll consolidate them, get them to Amy, get the responses back and share them with everyone. If you would do that, by the end of day tomorrow, then I think we can look for a response on Monday. Thank you all. Mark, can I, can I just make one recommendation? I'm gonna, uh, if it's all right, if I want Betsy, just make one Google Doc, Mark, and okay. we can hyperlink oh, sure, that's that in the idea. agenda. That way you don't have, you know, a bunch of emails, and then that way you can just use that one document and and send to get some feedback. 
that fair? Yep. And um, at the uh, superintendent's suggestion, we will be uh, having a follow-up on the uh, understanding and administration of the Title IX policy and how that grievance procedure is administered in your hands uh, so that you understand uh, sort of applying the principles that Amy just described, okay? Do you know who our Title IX coordinator is? Brad. Brad. So Brad is listed, but Brad is listed as our ADA coordinator, our 504 coordinator, our Title IX coordinator, and um, that's a lot, right? Brad is the uh, coordinator for uh, or ADA, um, and I believe that Diane is the 504 coordinator. Well, she's not. She leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so Brad, Brad does all the student. <laughs> Brad does all the student-related <laughs> Title IX, and I do all the employee-related Title IX. So that's the difference. 